Hello there and welcome back to another episode of the Daily Upari. I hope that you had a wonderful day yesterday and in today's episode we're going to be creating this portrait painting study and I'll spare you the details uh, this time so this is again with my Tuesday morning group I think we'll just get right into painting so here is our model Daisha and again we're going to be working from life so you're going to be seeing footage of me painting a little heads up though, I won't really, you won't see much of the color mixtures uh, for this portrait painting study, but I'll be able to explain them to you. They're really not that complicated. And so the goal of this portrait study is going to be very similar to uh, the charcoal drawing that we did last week. And in fact, I think that this is a pretty good way of connecting the two. So if you're interested in getting into oil painting, I would suggest you watch this one and last week's. So remember, this is a daily painting show. But again, last Tuesday, I went back to my portrait painting group you know I run a Tuesday morning portrait painting group and last Tuesday I did a charcoal study very similar to this one but it was with charcoal and you can see hopefully you will be able to see by the time that uh, this video is over of course this video won't be super long um, but you'll be able to see very similar uh, similar aspects of oil paint to uh, Charcoal. That is, they handle very similarly. Okay, so we're going to be working with basic masses, and again, you see right away the uh, the proportion of the face relative to the rectangle of the canvas has already been decided. So I know where that I want the face to fit roughly in the rectangle, and here we have a very simple shape now for the axis of the eyes getting the angle between the eyes and now we're going to throw in a center line so remember i am working from life so you will not have a photo reference in the top left corner of your screen just because again i don't think it's fair to you know show you the photo reference i didn't work from the photo reference at all i was working from life and again this is another portrait study um I really like to do as many of these from life as possible, especially if I'm planning to do a larger painting. I am planning to do a larger painting of our model Daisha in the same pose, but with all the flowers and stuff like that. Uh, so I just think that it's really useful for me to be able to create these studies from life. And um, right now I'm just using burnt umber with a little bit of odorless mineral spirits. And we're working on a 11 by 14 inch cotton canvas that has been pre-toned with oil paint. And see how we're just using simple straight lines and angles to uh, kind of place in where the uh, shadow shapes are going to fit. Finally, my camera's autofocus is coming into play. <laughs> so again, let's take a look at our model Daisha. And again, each time it goes dark, each time the screen goes dark, it's as if you're observing from my eyes. Each time the screen goes dark, it's kind of like I'm blinking, really. And um, since this video is in the voiceover style, I will give myself, or I will give you moments where I'll pause, just so I'm not overwhelming you with too much talking. And now we just sketched in a kind of very basic shape for the uh, the shadow. I kind of unified all of the darks. So this is an umber sketch. You probably haven't seen me do an umber sketch in a very, very long time. Uh, so I, I'll tell you what. The and I know I say that a lot. But anyway, uh, what I'm trying to do here is to get maybe about, I don't know, 80% or whatever of accuracy in terms of the placement of the shapes. And I'm trying to relate all of these shapes to one another. Notice there's not really too much careful measuring going on. All of this is basically from, you know, observing the model at a glance, like you're seeing in your screen. Um, you know, when we zoom in and zoom out, you can also see, uh, you can also see kind of the looseness of it. And again, it, it's really similar to charcoal. So I'll be talking about that a little bit too because with the charcoal you can just push it around very similar to the uh, oil paint though I will say that charcoal is a little bit easier to, to handle than the oil paint so again um, 
if you're really interested in getting into oil painting, I would highly suggest uh, working with charcoal, very similar to uh, what I did last Tuesday. And with a little bit of, I, I believe that was a lizard and crimson permanent and ivory black, we're shooting for gold. We're getting, we're trying to get the exact value that we want for the hair. And just a very simple shape just to cover, just trying to cover the masses. So the idea with the umber sketch was to try and get, um, to try and get a very simple, uh, very simple placements for where, you know, the eyes, the nose, and the mouth are going to fit. But, you know, 90%, 80%, 90% pushing it. Maybe we're about 70% accurate. Not very, not very close, but... The, the main thing was to place the head and notice how quickly we're moving. This is all in real time. So you've seen how quickly, and again, this is not in time lapse. I'm not moving in time lapse. So um, again, you're seeing it in real time as I'm trying to fill in all of the masses. And I think that this is a very uh, liberating way of working where we're not really coloring within the lines. Notice how the line isn't really that well established on the uh, outside of the face. You know, we're not worried about outlines. And you're when you're working with mass, you really want to work from the the inside out. So again, working from the outlines is a way to work from the outside in. Working from mass is a way to work from the uh, inside out. And I think it's important to have a combination of both in your toolkit, in your repertoire of uh, approaches that you have. And I'm also switching between brushes. So we have a brush for the hair, we have a brush for the background, and we have a brush for the form shadow on the side of the face. You know, and, and like in yesterday's video, the one about the apple, I really do like the metaphor of, you know, think about each day. Imagine each day is like a blank canvas. It's full of endless possibilities, infinite, an infinite number of things that you can do. And that's the beauty of life. That's the beauty of being able to wake up every morning, uh, you know, wake up every morning to a painting or, you know, whatever you enjoy to do and to just continue to perfect your craft or continue to move towards figuring out what you want to do. You know, not all of us are fortunate to know exactly what we want to do. Here we are observing our model, Daisha, again. And we're using a little bit of the cadmium green and cadmium red medium together, and a little bit of sap green. So uh, you were actually able to see, uh, thankfully, <laughs> you're able to see the palette a little bit in this frame. Remember, I don't have a camera crew. I tried to position the palette as close to the, um, I tried to lift the palette as close to the canvas as possible, but I, I mean, to be honest, I was much more focused on trying to uh, create this portrait study and the camera was just something I set behind me. In the future, I really wanna have a camera crew <laughs> to do all of the cinematography for me. Okay, so remember that mixture, okay? It was cadmium, red, medium, that is a gambling color and, um, Whatchamacallit? The whatchamacallit color. Sorry, brain's not working right now. It was cadmium red medium and cadmium green mixed together with my flake white and then with a little bit of sap green. That's how I got my first flesh tone. So I'm trying to read out my first flesh tone to you. So what I'm doing is I'm thinking of this very sculpturally. That is, a sculptor probably wouldn't be thinking about, you know, outlines or anything like that. A sculptor would be thinking about large blocks of form. So each one of these values now indicates a, a form. And a very simple and general form in a way. So you can see the straight lines and angles on a two-dimensional uh, level also relate to a three-dimensional level in terms of plane. You can see very clearly there on the uh, the cheekbone. 
And in this footage, you, I do have much more, uh, you know, of the footage filming from life. I think even than last, last time where I was doing the charcoal drawing. So you will see me once in a while uh, correcting the pose. You will see some movement. Uh, among my uh, artist friends in the background that's me talking to the camera um i was telling the camera you know the pose can change uh you know in in life you don't want to be you don't want to chase the pose so i set my center line very early remember that so those of you that are interested in working from life um set your center line very early and tell yourself is the model in three quarter? Is the model in profile? Is the model f facing you forward? So in my case, I was kind of dead set on three quarter, only slightly closer to profile. So the reason you didn't hear any of the audio of me talking is because we have the classical radio playing in the background, and I really don't want to get demonetized for playing even a second of uh, you know music that I don't have any license to, basically. So. Yeah, once in a while I may talk to the camera, <laughs> but I, I'm sorry, I can't really play the audio just because I don't want to get demonetized because we have the classical radio playing in the background. So observing our model, Daisha, again, and we just blinked, and here we are back into here at the blink of an eye. Now we're going to be pushing the uh, background color. So here's the trick, okay? Or maybe it's not a trick, but here's a way of thinking. Let's try to paint exactly what we're seeing in front of us but with much less detail and it's a very relaxing way to think about it you know even you don't even have to be a painter you're, you're able to you know take in that kind of philosophy like think about the big things in life before getting hung up on any kind of minutia or any kind of detail you know have an idea of the big picture you know, like you're studying for an exam or something, you know, you're not going to think about all of the tiny little, you know, uh, redox reactions or something for chemistry, or you're not going to get too focused on like what variable a certain equation has, like what letter. You're going to focus much more into, you know, the what the equation does, what the chemical reaction does on a broad scale. Or if you study law or something like that, like you're not going to focus. Well, actually, that's different. I haven't studied law, so I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> but I have some science and some math in my background, so I'll talk about that. Just not as much. So at this time, it started getting really, really sunny. As you notice, the light changed so later on i'll change the light sensitivity on the camera so what happened was there was a model break so after the model break i repositioned the camera and noticed that the i didn't notice this okay i'm noticing it now that the light is much brighter so that's another aspect when you're working from life working from nature is that you know things change you know the only constant in life is change so you're going to have to learn how to adapt to that, especially if you want to work from life. And working from life kind of breaks you out of this copy mentality that we tend to have, especially when working from photo reference. And I'll give myself little, uh, or I'll give you some momentary pauses just so you can observe me paint without me overwhelming you with too much talking. And that plane right there is for the glabella. And I'm working very broad, very basic. So notice how the outlines aren't finished, but we do have some very fa basic flesh tones that we're able to sculpt with. So um, in a way, we're working from the inside out. Literally, as you can tell, working from the inside of the corner of the eye. And then molding all of the shapes into a much more specific outline. It's a really fun and really liberating way of working. Now, you know, you're not going to have every single brush stroke, obviously, in this painting because that would be impossible for me to create this painting in 30 minutes. So, again, I find that, you know, after I did the Q&A, after I did the Q&A, I noticed that a lot of people didn't really want the longer 
videos. So I'm trying to edit them to be more suitable for the majority of the audience. But I did find some folks that really enjoyed um, when I filmed every single brushstroke and talked at the same time. So I am planning on doing that again. Maybe I have another picture of Steve, so maybe I'll do another one of Steve. You know, I really enjoy painting Steve. And the half tone on the side of the forehead, I actually do remember that color combination. It's a combination of our cadmium red and our sap green and with a touch of yellow ochre. You wouldn't expect the, um, you know, the complementary colors to give you these, uh, you know, darker flesh tones. But they actually work extremely well. And um, so look at, now we're observing our model at a glance. Now we're returning back to the the flesh tones. And if you notice, the flesh tone on the forehead is really close to nature. I think that that was probably one of my best flesh tone mixtures. And again, it was pretty much just our cadmium red medium and our sap green with a little bit of yellow ochre. Flesh tones don't have to be that difficult. And we're just over the halfway point now with today's episode. So I hope that today's episode is a little more relaxing, a little more laid back. You know, I'm talking to you after the fact. So it's almost like we're watching the footage together. It's a little bit of alizarin crimson permanent we're pushing a warmer tone on the nose i'll tell you what one thing you don't really see that uh in the photo reference that much or when we zoom into our model uh, but there is a very uh, deep and reddish tone on the uh the nose that's very similar to that of the background but it's a little bit uh sh should i say more of a earthy red Whereas the background is much more of a, you know, cooler pink. And in that way, we're relating the colors. So these are color relationships that I'm describing to you. And, um, you know, if you're new to painting and you're new to the concept of color relationships, a really good way to observe these color relationships is with just like a white block try to find a white block and try to paint it in sunlight maybe six o'clock in the morning paint that white block again maybe like in the afternoon and then in the evening light you know just like monet's haystacks and try to observe how those color relationships impact the quality of the light because relating those colors on a block can really train you to relate colors when you're working with large planes of color, just like we're working here. And whoa, I just cut a huge corner into the side of the face. And again, it's see, that's the kind of freedom that I was talking about. That's the kind of freedom to just move right into it. And uh, you can see the model here. She is turned a little closer to profile, I think, than I had before. And I must have noticed that in this point at this point. So I am pushing the cheek a little further to the left of the canvas. And now we're just basically building, to be honest. Now we're subdividing these larger shapes into smaller shapes. And I'm still using all bristles at this point. For the majority of this painting, I did use bristle brushes. And, um, you know, something magical happens when you use uh, bristle brushes, artist grade oil paint loads of paint and a medium that you enjoy. My medium that I'm using is Neo McGill Medium. When you have all of those materials in play and you're working with tons and tons of paint and you're working from life like this, try it out. This is something I do recommend you do at home or in an artist studio. You know what I mean? It's a really, really liberating and really fun experience, though the awkward stage is real, okay? <laughs> I know you're sitting there listening to me. The awkward stage is real, especially when we're painting from life. I mean, if Daisha walks and then looks at my painting at this stage, I'd be kind of embarrassed. But at the same time, I've, I've done enough portrait paintings that I'm okay with the awkward stage. You know, I'm okay with the portrait looking a little bit awkward. And there's a lot more pressure, I will admit, um, I'm trying to break out of the awkward stage when especially when you're working from life and you know amongst other artists 
So just take note of that. The awkward stage is real. And it's just something that happens. You know, each time we add one new piece of information into the portrait, it, it brings another awkward stage. And that's okay. That's just part of it. So if you find yourself getting nervous uh, when you're painting a portrait, especially from life amongst other artists, just know that I feel the same way too. It's a very natural thing that occurs within all of us, even if we have years and years and years and years and years of experience like I do. I don't think I mentioned this earlier. I probably should have mentioned it earlier, um, but if you're interested in knowing exactly what colors are on my palette. Uh, if you scroll down to the description box down below, uh, right below the play button, I think there should be a little arrow. Uh, just click on it, scroll down past the description, and you'll see I have typed up something that says the materials that we used, and then you'll see the list of the colors starting from the titanium white, the flake white, and then all the way across till we reach the ivory black. And of course, the medium is typed up in there too. And here we are in the darker middle tone region of the palette. And as you notice, the palette has a color value web on it. I'm sure you know by now. I really like to organize the values on my palette, uh, you know, such that it goes from dark to light or light to dark or whatever, just so what happens on the palette, the organization on the palette is, uh, that influences the painting in some way and it does really it, it helps me make sure that my values are in check and remember i said that i'm probably talking too much remember i said that um, this is a study again another study uh, because i want to do a larger painting of daisha one thing i noticed after this painting was all said and done was that I'm not a big fan of that red background against her skin color. I don't know. I just, I think that it's too, I don't know. Maybe the value is too close to the value of the flesh tones. Though the exposure is pretty high on the uh, footage you're seeing right now. But I, I will say that when I start the larger portrait of her, whether I start it on or off camera or paint it on and off camera, I'm not sure yet, but... I think I will change the background color, and I think this is really important, especially for those of you that are interested in larger paintings. Do as many studies as possible, because after this painting was all said and done, I realized I wasn't a fan of the background color in relation to her skin tones. I can't really tell you why. I think it might just be because of the values. And I'm just giving you some kind of quiet time, uh, just so I'm not talking at the same rate throughout the entire video. And so now with the titanium white, ultramarine blue, and cobalt teal, and I think I did throw in a little bit of cadmium green. We're going to be painting in that kind of turquoise color for the clothing that our model is wearing. She does have a shirt underneath of that uh, fabric. But in any case, um, you know, the fabric is kind of draped like a toga to look kind of like a toga to set a more classical mood for this painting. And that color, I'm relating it to the chroma of the surrounding colors. And I will say that that fabric, I believe, is the most chromatic color. And so chroma is basically the saturation that a color has. You know, you think of a stop sign or a red light. Most of us are more, uh, we can think more of a red. Okay, think of a red light, okay? A red light, you know, like you have red, yellow, green, uh, where you're driving, a red light is much more saturated than the red on, say, um, a rose, even. So, there are certain instances when I'm painting, like yesterday's painting, 
that you saw. Um, see, look at the uh, the fabric. I was describing it to be very, very chromatic, and it doesn't show up on the uh, the camera. And this is a pretty decent quality camera, but that just goes to show you that you can't really trust the photo reference too much in terms of the colors that we're observing from nature. So it turns out that I'm talking more about colors and color relationships from nature in this video more than I thought. Um, so anyway, what, what I'm doing here is with a uh, very thin brush just putting in the outside shape, a very simple line. See how I was talking about working from the inside out? So we've put in all of the shapes for the, uh, you know, the uh, the face and the flesh tones, and now we're able to steer specific and, you know, push the paint towards a deeper level of specificity. And like I was saying before, um, you know, some videos, some paintings, you'll see me pushing color much more. Like yesterday's video of that apple, I pushed that apple much more saturated than it would be in life, okay? But in this one, I'm really, really studying those color relationships, and I'm really trying to get the color as truthful as what I'm observing in nature. But here's the trick, okay? When you're trying to observe colors from nature, don't think about color matching. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't think about color matching. Instead, think about color relationships. Now, you can paint a portrait however you like. I'm never going to tell you, you must do this, you must do that. But what I'm trying to give you is advice on how to observe color from nature. See how the color is kind of flat on the... Uh, on the video, even though this is a pretty high quality, you're probably, you can see this in 1080p. It's a very HD image, but you know, even though we have much less detail and you know, much less, you know, specificity in terms of eyelashes and things like that on our painting here, the color relationships in the large value families are much more keenly observed by the human eye than the photo reference. And that's my buddy Jim Atkins walking there. <laughs> amazing, amazing artist. He always gives me very useful advice. Let's all say, hey Jim. Hey Jim. I know, I can be a little bit weird sometimes. But it wouldn't be fun if it was always the same kind of stuff, would it be? I don't think so. So we're pushing a little bit more light right there on the superciliary arch, right above the um, the eyebrow. You know, and after watching that Studio and Kaminati demonstration, uh, you know, the trip that I took to Philadelphia, uh, the, the sculptor, I forgot his name, Stephen Perkins, I think he said, he said, learn anatomy as much as you can but when you're painting from or drawing or whatever from life don't think about looking for say i'm looking exactly for the zygomatic bone i'm looking exactly for the superciliary um and it actually makes sense because even though you know i just said that was a light for the superciliary arch on the on the skull it was intuitive like i knew the anatomy but i didn't I didn't have to overanalyze it. You internalize all of the information you take in, and then it just becomes automatic when you're painting. And we only have a couple minutes left in today's episode. So again, I really hope that today's episode is, you know, very calm, relaxing, positive. And that's what I'm after. And with the smaller synthetic brushes now, I'm going to be putting much more specificity into the shapes. So, you know, like a little, even a single brush stroke, as you're seeing there, uh, can describe a lot. And what we're doing is we're putting in the hoops. I think that's what they're called. I don't know. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that those earrings are called hoops. And with titanium white cobalt teal, I put in a little bit of highlight. I will say it's thinned out with a little bit of odorless mineral spirits. Oh, this is a nice brush stroke. 
isn't that just magical? Uh, just a single brush stroke to indicate, you know, the earrings or maybe two brush strokes, and that's it. Okay, so now the flowers that we put in. I did accidentally uh, film the flowers off the, at the wrong angle, uh, but you know, there's not too much detail on the flowers, and they're painted wet on wet. For the lighter region of the flowers, I use cadmium yellow medium, and then for the darker regions, I use cadmium yellow deep. Yes, I do have many yellows on my palette. And then for the little dark spots in between the flowers, nothing. I just used what was already there. And we're at about a minute left here, so um, what you're seeing is I'm pretty sure the last 20 minute pose. Uh, so remember, when you're working from life, you want to time it so that the model has breaks every 15 minutes, every 20 minutes, or 30 minutes if the model is feeling ambitious. So this is just me putting in the final little touches on this study. And I think that that was the timer. Yep, that was the timer. And so that is today's oil painting study. That being said, I hope that you have a wonderful day. And remember, in a world that can be so negative, be the spark that ignites positivity amongst all of us. Have an amazing day, and I'll be back again very soon.